They say pictures paint a thousand words. So how to use visuals in your presentation. That's just some of what we'll be discussing in this episode of Talking Talks. Hello and welcome to Talking Talks, a behind the scenes look at how great presenters make great presentations. I'm your host, Bree Williams, and today I'm joined by Lynn Kazali. Lynn helps individuals, teams, and businesses transition to better ways of thinking and working. Lynn is an international keynote speaker, multi award winning author of eight books, and a master facilitator. She's also spent over 10,000 hours on air as a radio broadcaster and producer. I'm really looking forward to speaking to Lynn. So let's get started. Lynn, welcome. So pleased to have you on Talking Talks. Now, what I'd love to start with is how did you work out that drawing is your superpower? Oh, I think it's maybe one of my superpowers. Um my background's in communication, so I spent a lot of my early, you know, professional career working with words and uh, in the public relations field. So always trying to explain things to people and help them make sense of things and probably used, you know, photography or clip art as it was then. Um, but when I found a combination where I could use stationery, which I love, <laughs> and and I could legitimately use it for work purposes. Uh, <laughs> when I, this is a win. How good is this? How good is this? So, yes, I saw um, uh, some years ago some people doing graphic recording and I thought, oh, that looks like fun. And, you know, next thing you know, uh, I was unlocking um, perhaps, a, I wouldn't say a superpower, but I was op op uh, unlocking some perhaps latent skill. <laughs> Well, I, I love that. Using um, using your, your skill as a tax deduction, I think, is gold <laughs> to support a stationary habit. And I'm also fascinated that you've spent over 10,000 hours in radio, either on air as a broadcaster or as a producer. And talk to me a little bit about that as a craft, contrasting with your visual design presentation skills. Yes, my radio time, I love a microphone, it started when I was still in secondary school and a, a, a school friend, Heather, uh, Heather Jarvis, and I used to listen to Melbourne Station PBS and they were asking for volunteers and you could come on in and learn how to operate the panel. And so we did that and we ended up broadcasting at, you know, 4 a.m. Uh, because that was that was the slot that they let uh, us Green, you know, new people in, but that again, that started and unlocked uh, a whole range of bringing together of different skills and interests I had, which was music, but also creating like creativity, not so much artistic, but the production element. I loved putting together a program and taking people on a bit of a uh, perhaps emotional journey of musical styles, you know, starting them with one piece of music and then introducing them to a whole lot of other music throughout the program. So that went on and on for many years and I had uh, breakfast programs that I presented and did some work with the ABC and a whole range of other broadcasters. So it, uh, it became a really powerful professional development for me that I would later use those skills in training, facilitating and keynote speaking. I love that. And a couple of times already you've mentioned this um, concept or hit on this concept of almost fusion. So you have skills and you've been able to coalesce them and bring them together. Is that something you've reflected on in your career and something that I know you train a lot of presenters, for instance, in as well? Yes, I think you can't help but do that. And if you're trying to do something else, you know, if you're looking for, oh, what's the, what's the new skill that I need to have or what's the fad skill that I should get, that's, I don't think that's what it's about. It's looking at what do you already have and how might you be able to bring that to the work that you're doing. And that way it's more natural, it's easier, and people 
respond to it so much better than if you're there you know, trying to be a something or other robotic you know learning oh i'm trying my new skill ah bring bring the stuff that's already you bring the stuff that's already you together and and integrate all of those parts uh, yeah it's easier and uh, better results I, I think that's so right and it's also very hard to for people to copy you so you have an inbuilt <laughs> uniqueness don't you of your life's journey and your your mix of experiences is this the benefit of, of experience looking back and saying, yes, um, now I can fuse those points? So take me back to early on in your um, presenting career, your keynote presenting particularly. How, how was it different to what you do now? Well, I was probably more nervous. Uh, I would have been doing a lot more volunteer. So I'll say, yes, I'll speak for free, whereas now it's a, it's a paid part of my uh, practice, a paid part of my business. Uh, not that I don't do, still do some voluntary uh, keynotes depending on who it's for and what they're wanting to get out of it and, and how that aligns with what I'm wanting to do. So that's one of the key things. Uh, but I also think there was there's a period of saying, oh, I have to create a presentation. And so people open up a PowerPoint deck. No, don't do that. And start crafting this presentation and it's it's the worst thing that you can do because you're now being forced into this default software package created not for that, not made for creativity, not made for random thoughts and and sense making. Uh, so, yeah, be careful. <laughs> be careful. I, I love that um, that warning. That warning. The warning on the box of PowerPoint is that it can stifle your creativity. So, and you don't have to give away all your secrets because I know that a lot of your practice is, you know, teaching people in these sorts of um, techniques. But rather than using PowerPoint, where would you suggest people go with if they were storyboarding, for instance, a presentation? Yeah, so they're starting, they're thinking about it, um, writing. So get get ideas out of your head. I've got a, a range of notepads and journals that I've just gone through over the years and I try and get all of my thoughts out of my head and muse and wonder about them. So to in contrast, to put an idea into a PowerPoint slide is saying, here's an idea and I'm not going to work with it anymore. But putting it onto paper says, let me explore this a bit more and sleep on it. You know, let your subconscious and your unconscious do some work for you, teasing it out and making other connections. Uh, and I also like to start gathering these thoughts early on. So if I'm booked for a keynote, I don't leave it till the last few days. I, I create an Evernote, I live in Evernote, I create an Evernote file for that uh, client or that, that gig. Uh, it may be a topic I've delivered on before, but I let those happy collisions that happen over time in the lead up to that keynote um, collect things for me and curate things for me. So, you know, that, that idea of things coming across our windscreen or the, the other metaphor is swimming and things coming across your mask as you are uh, got your mask and snorkel on, is that helps you stay alert to these are all the things, these are all the projects I'm working on and, and seeing all these wonderful uh, resources kind of present themselves as you're working on them. So... Don't uh, don't start creating in that kind of app, but but let those thoughts um, uh, out first of all to externalise them from your head, and then give them some time to marinate or percolate or whatever that that kind of sense is. That let these ideas uh, expand a bit uh, over some time. That's really interesting. So how? How far forward would you look for a keynote? So um, you've got a booking, I don't know, in, in two months' time. Do you start that process of capturing something, initial thoughts in Evernote, and then you kind of let it percolate and, and look at the Band-Aid going past the mask <laughs> underwater? <laughs> so so what's your sort of time frame, your ideal time frame, I should say? 
Oh, well, it's uh, be hard to say because I'm responding to it, whether it's a bureau that's booking me, which could be a year in advance, so bookings for 2022. Um, so I can see those in my diary, uh, but there's also things that could happen in a shorter time frame. So that's certainly happening at the moment in this environment uh, where it might be just over a week's notice, if you know, if that. So I'm always looking at what have I already done? What do I already have that I might be able to integrate again? How how might I solve this problem that they have using some of my um, existing ideas? Not to just replicate the same um, keynote, even though that has legs. You know, that's that's got some good opportunities connected to it too. So timing. I, I, as a bit of an improviser, I have to use the timing I've got or the timing I've given. Um, and it's interesting to think a keynote that's over a year away, how I think about it now and how I think about it in a year's time, wow, they could be very, very different. A whole lot of things could have evolved. I've so got, it's I've... funny when, you, you know, you deliver a keynote that was booked 18 months, two years ago, and you think, wow, my ideas have evolved so much since then. Do I want to go back to visit that topic as it was in that time, or will I show them 2.0 or 3.0 of that thinking? It's interesting, isn't it? Because and I've, there is a TED Talk, I'm trying to remember who it was, whether it was Tim Urban or someone else, um, you know, we often think of procrastination as being a problem, which is, you know, we push a project down the line so we don't get around to it, and that is a danger. But uh, this person was also talking, did they call it procrastination, which is sometimes people jump in too quickly and they they um, churn out the work and then they haven't given it the time to breathe. They haven't given it the time to expand and really morph. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the books I wrote on perfectionism uh, called Ish, which looks at the problems of not starting perfection, uh, procrastination and then not finishing, which is perfectionism. And I call them naughty school friends because they hang around with each other and they egg each other on <laughs> and don't start is saying, ha, 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 I'm not starting and don't stop is saying, that's all right, you know, you start whenever you're ready because I'll never be finished. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think in playing with that, uh, uh, a lot of the work I've done over the last 10 years or so has been with agile software development teams. So they're into start uh, and work on something incrementally, just work on a slice of something and see how that goes. So I might find myself slipping a little bit of new content in to test it out, to see how it goes, to help me then expand on it in future presentations. So that incremental and then iterative improvement over time will put procrastination and perfectionism, you know, send it up to the principal's office. It'll be in big trouble. I like that very much. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, identifying what could be the perils and, and working out solutions for yourself sort of to keep you on, on track for that for sure. And, and so it sounds very much like if I attended a presentation you gave this year and I got rock up to another conference next year and, oh, good, Lynn's on, I'm going to pop in and, and see what Lynn's got to say. For different clients, are you delivering different presentations are you making them custom to that situation or as you say just switching you know a percentage of content yeah I'm really looking at the whole thing and going what's what is still current what's still relevant what's my perspective for them where are they at at the moment so it it could be one slide that's the same or one model um, or it could be one activity that I'm facilitating with the audience uh, but it could equally be a whole new, you know, I've had several keynotes this year on uh, topics like leading hybrid teams. Even though I had a keynote of that last year, it's changed. Everything's changing. Everything's evolving. So I've got new examples, new case studies, new data, uh, and therefore I've got new prescriptions of what I think people should be doing. So then you look at the industry or sector they're in and go, 
well, how, how might they work with this? Are they already, you know, a hybrid or remote team? Uh, am I starting at the beginning and I don't need to, you know, their, their uh, knowledge could be quite advanced now. And I, I think, you know, I've seen this, I've seen quite a few presentations where I've been a participant on things like remote learning or leading a remote team. And they're starting right at the beginning. And I feel like saying, hey, you don't need this bit. You can accelerate because we've all been doing it. Um, so accelerate through some of that earlier stuff or find that it's redundant now and new things have come in to take its place. So always, um, always tailoring the presentation and some things might remain and something you know some slides i hide because they're not going to be shown and uh, and other concepts and ideas i'm bringing in because they're quite new you are enormously productive at least eight books i think it's up to eight <laughs> it's probably more on the way keynotes and um taking time to consider specific each specific context and the maturity of the audience in regards to the topic tips for managing time and effort what's the efficiency here that perhaps i'm not getting it's time boxing so setting your timer on your phone and uh, working in short packets of time and then when that time is up get up and move go and do something else uh, so I cringe a little when I hear people say, oh, now I'm going to have to sit down and work on that keynote. And I think, why don't, firstly, why don't you stand up? So who says you have to sit down? But that perception that, oh, I need a huge block of time. Uh, before our uh, call here, I noticed I had about seven minutes and I went, great, that's enough for me to put in some ideas for a proposal I'm putting together. So it's using little swatches of time to to do things uh, where they fall throughout the day. That That is the best, I think, for me anyway, the best uh, productivity solution is not only knowing what work I've got to do, but when might I be able to get that done throughout the day? And if it's not today, so what? I just change the date in my diary and push it over to tomorrow <laughs> like the rest of us, you know, go, oh, it's not that urgent, I'll do it tomorrow. And if I've done that for a week or two, I look at it and go, maybe I don't even need to do that. Maybe it's just something that's sitting up here. Oh, you need to do that, Lynn. No, maybe I don't. Delete, gone, nobody knew. I had it there. Nobody knew I was going to do it. Nobody knows I didn't do it. Very, very interesting in terms of um, time boxing. Yeah. Is Evernote again your go-to capture? Because I think one of the um, challenges if you find yourself, well, it used to be in traffic or commuting, and, you know, you have these snippets of time between, perhaps it's between phone calls more so these days. Having a repository that you immediately can draw upon and capture your ideas. How is technology supporting you in that? Yes, I think I'm still a big fan of analog uh, notepads, like I was saying. So I've got that one's finished, um, lots of stuff going on in there. So I digitize that. I'll open up an Evernote file, take a scan of it so that uh -huh. it's searchable, the text is searchable. And as someone recently, I know, left their beautiful journal in a car and the car then went into state. And so they had to wait like six days or something until the, the, uh, the journal was found and it could be sent back to them, that you won't lose those you know, genius thoughts you have if you at least digitise it. But I'm finding um talk to text just so good that i will sit here and dictate my ideas to myself in, in an evernote file and i'll make a note that i talked that you know that i spoke it that it wasn't typed or it wasn't handwritten um, i'm also using voice memo on my phone a lot just to bleh, just to speak out an idea and particularly when I'm walking, headphones in, connected to the phone, press voice memo, just what, what am I going through here? What am I talking about? What am I thinking of? What ideas are popping into my head? So I'm trying to use all of my um, senses. I guess I'm using that 
idea of documenting things and and writing them uh, but i'm also uh, speaking them because we know that to really embody a good presentation it's got to be in you it can't just be read from the page so if i can get used to speaking some ideas they'll end up you know, translating easier and clearer and i think cleaner to uh, to the audience so there are a couple of the key tech tools i use uh, particularly for uh, working on presentations but uh, the time box is that has been seen to be one of the best productivity tools ever uh, and if you're not using it you're letting time just you know bleed out of your day <laughs> I do love the sense of embodiment. You mentioned that um, you, you, by the time you're on stage, you really want to have it in your DNA almost. It's such an interesting cycle, isn't it? Because we often work through the intellectual um, you know, prism and, and intellectualise things, which perhaps started as a, a feeling more so anyway, but it goes through this whole um, rationalization cycle before it needs then to become part of our emotion almost for it to have resonance yeah and if you don't connect with something that you're speaking about then why is it in your presentation if you think oh I really should say something about blah and it's a mechanical cold you know disengaging topic but oh I tick the box not not so good i would hope that before you deliver something to someone you've tried it on you know you've walked around the house or you've spoken it out loud you've heard yourself uh driving for me is uh, is a great way to to speak about what what am i thinking of uh in terms of this topic or this story or this message you know what what order am i going to deliver these points in oh let me try that order the other way around let me start with the end and then and switch those chunks of information around until i think we've tried that where we're going in a more of a vanilla uh, direction we keep either following the same patterns or we're doing you know we're we're delivering something exactly as we read it in a journal or a book with all of that said, I'd love to share now some images of you on stage. So let's have a look at um, at some firstly visual design examples. So people are probably wondering, yeah, what what are we talking about when we talk about Lynn's um, Lynn's visual? So let's have. And I've got thirty icons that you can practice and share, which I love to send out to you, and also a little mini book called Making Sense. Or we can do something more strategic, more responsive, more agile and cut a path through to some high levels of team performance. So join in this session and I'll be using my flip chart to go through some of the key elements of adaptive thinking. So I, I hope that has given people a sense that a lot of your images are organic, but you also use things like matrices to capture ideas. Yes, yeah, so the visual icons or imagery are they're very simple i have no artistic training you know this is not from uh, oh i've loved drawing since i was four years old no i cried at kindergarten when we had to do finger painting like it just was not my thing i'd rather be out in the playground uh sitting on uh, sitting on this big log out there that my father had put a steering wheel on and playing trucks uh, i was more interested in that so the drawing doesn't come from um, a deep interest of mine it comes from my background in communication is what's the quickest way that I can get this message to this audience or this group or this stakeholder and when you look at the science behind image transfer and image recall and image acceleration for productivity then you'd be crazy if you didn't put some sort of some more imagery into presentations so Yes, if it's not already uh, pre-drawn, still hand-drawn, uh, I love to do them live because it fires up people's um, engagement much greater than if I show just a photograph or a boring, uh, boring slide. Here's, here's one I cooked earlier. In fact, I've got <laughs> a clip of you. It was um, in one of your presentations and you received a an audience question and I just love how you deal with that in a real-time illustration so let's have a look at that 
Do you ever find yourself getting stuck, a bit of mental block when you're yes. trying to... Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And here's what I draw. So I'll create a new screen. So if I don't know what to do, I pick up a marker and I stride over to the whiteboard or flip chart and I draw this. And the room hushes. <laughs> and everyone looks at the circle. Focus, you know, I've just focused everybody on something. So I'll often draw a circle, but I use that with a team who were arguing and bickering over what was in and out of scope. The stuff that was in scope, we wrote here. The stuff that was out of scope, you know, scope, we wrote around here. And then we worked out the bits that we were really bickering about. And there were only two or three bits and we got those nailed real quick. Meeting done, out of the room, back to good stuff. Draw a circle if you don't know what to do. They're lovely kind of harmonious shapes. <laughs> loved it, loved it, loved it. So is it, it, that's part of the facilitation that, that you um, talk to people about. Yes, so uh, being able to bring visual skills to your own work, whether you're a leader of a team or uh, you're a speaker or trainer or facilitator or coach yourself, you don't have to either use other people's stuff or learn art. So I think if you can uh, draw a few shapes and then combine some of those shapes to make some imagery, uh, you'll you'll be able to get that benefit of of you know sorting out what your own thinking is, but then also that facilitation role. How can I help others, you know, resolve their thinking or understand what it is they're working on? So. Visual facilitation is a thing. It's a, a, a type of practice of, of facilitation. Uh, so it's a deliberate strategy, I guess, that you might put to work with a team or group. And, uh, and I love uh, sharing those skills and giving people a bit more confidence than thinking, oh, I can't show my picture. You know, so stop making it about yourself. Uh, just put something up there that might help them understand it. They won't even be, you know, worrying about your your drawing or your visual capability. You are. <laughs> That's interesting. It's it's like um, the ultimate prop, isn't it? That um, people's attention is off you deliberately, so and you're focusing people's attention somewhere else. And it's like, oh, I can, yes, I can almost. Uh, <laughs> relax for a moment yeah well uh, the NLP world uh, talked about it as three-point communication so it's one point two point let's look at this third thing uh, and that's what enables us to go deeper on the content not awkward in our engagement if you can focus on the third piece of information that's what you end up working on and so no wonder meetings get accelerated thinking is clearer, we do end up on the same page, we work out what page we are actually on, um, and you know, we're, we're better collaborators, we're better co-creators. Enormously clarifying for people, and I think, um, yeah, a, a, a sense of ownership as well, because it's not just you prefabricating what the solution is, it's really giving them the, the, the space and the design to project into something question I did have around um, perhaps the balance between real-time versus um, pre-set images is how you maintain the momentum and the flow of a session rather than, for instance, oh, oh she's drawing again, she's drawing again, and, and that's sort of losing the, um, the pace of your presentation. Mm. Well, I, that's a deliberate thing. I, I think we have to vary the pace of our presentation we can't get people to a level of engagement and keep them there they'll be exhausted by the time we've finished so we do want a rise and fall in energy you do want a quieter moment where you're not saying anything so that people are able to do their sense making they integrate information synthesize it take it from their short-term memory into their long term and then take out the trash with anything that they don't want to keep so I think the the idea of a rhythm or a flow, whatever that is, is I, I'm, I want to say I'm less hung up about that because I want to let it rise and fall. What I do want to know about, though, is how am I starting this thing? 
and how am I finishing this thing? Because that's, I, I want to start with some energy and I absolutely want to bring people up and, you know, and finish with, finish with some power. But what happens in between, you know, have a look at uh, Nancy Duarte's uh, books on her tracking the storyline of uh, many keynote presentations and they rise and fall in, in all sorts of places. Uh, if they think, ah, oh, she's drawing again, that's great. Focus, attention, <laughs> I've got them, you know, I've got their, their uh, mirror neurons in their brain are just uh, firing up, waiting to see what, what's this going to be, uh, highly engaging. I love it, Lynn. This, um, this time together has absolutely flown. I really appreciate you <laughs> sharing so much of your process and unfortunately, it's all we have time for on this episode of Talking Talks. If you want to find more about Lynn, let me just get Lynn's website, lynnkazali.com. Lynn, also, you have a YouTube channel, so I'll make sure that I link to that in the, uh, in the notes below. You can also always find me at my website, Um, But... I implore people so that you don't miss future great episodes just like this one. Please subscribe, talk, tell people about Talking Talks and I look forward to sharing so much with you in a future episode. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Bree.